What is up, people? Welcome back. So, what does it mean to be unemployed? It turns out the answer isn't as straightforward as you might think. But what is straightforward is smashing that like button, subscribing, and ringing the notification bell. All right, so unemployment is the second of our big three economic measurements. GDP measures how much stuff we're making, and unemployment looks at how many people it takes to make that stuff. There are actually a bunch of different ways that economists measure unemployment, but the main unemployment rate, the one that you see mentioned on the news, because I know you watch the news all the time, and the one we use in this class, defines a person as unemployed only if they don't have a job and they are actively searching for a job. This means that a person who is qualified for a better job than they currently have or who wants to work full-time but only has a part-time job, they are not considered unemployed because, well, they have a job. They are sometimes referred to as underemployed, but a person with a master's degree who's working at Walmart isn't unemployed because they have a job. Additionally, there's a group of people referred to as discouraged workers who don't have a job and they want a job, but the job market has been so bad for so long they've actually given up looking. And since they aren't currently looking for a job, they're not considered unemployed. This creates a weird situation where if enough workers become so discouraged with the job market that they actually give up looking for a job, it could decrease the unemployment rate. Let me explain how that could be. To calculate the unemployment rate, just take the number of unemployed people and divide that by the size of the labor force. I know, I know. What's the labor force? The labor force is equal to the number of employed people plus the number of unemployed people. Just to reiterate, that means the labor force includes everybody who either currently has a job or doesn't have one but is actively searching for a job. So if we go back to the unemployment rate measurement, if a large group of people who are out of work are looking for a job, the unemployment rate might look like this. But then if a bunch of them become so discouraged that they actually give up and stop looking for a job, it reduces both the numerator and the denominator because they're no longer considered unemployed and they're also not part of the labor force anymore. So now the unemployment rate could actually fall because of this. This is problematic because the unemployment rate is supposed to measure the health of the labor market, but this shows how the measurement can be misleading. One more calculation is the labor force participation rate, which measures the percentage of people in the population who are part of the labor force. Again, meaning that they either have a job or are actively seeking a job. Sometimes we'll get a little bit more specific than population and say working age population or say age 16 and up. So just be aware of that. It doesn't change anything though. So that's how we measure unemployment. But now let's talk about types of unemployment because the fact is that there are different causes for unemployment. So let's explore three of those right now. Frictional unemployment is unemployment that arises from being engaged in a job search. For example, a person who just graduated from college and is entering the job market for the first time is considered frictionally unemployed. Or a person who leaves their job to move to another city and is looking for another job. While it's true that a person must be looking for a job to be counted as unemployed regardless of what type of unemployment we classify them, the root cause of why a person is frictionally unemployed is because they are voluntarily looking for a job. You'll see that it's different with the other two types. Structural unemployment, on the other hand, can be a little bit messier because it's an involuntary form of unemployment. Basically, there's a mismatch between the skills the person has and the available jobs. Very often, technological progress is the root cause of structural unemployment. For example, a cashier losing his job at a supermarket because of self-checkout machines. That would be considered an example of structural unemployment. Or a toll booth operator who loses her job when the state introduces toll by plate technology. Or a factory worker whose job is replaced by robots or maybe outsourced to a foreign nation. These are all examples of structural unemployment. Cyclical unemployment is unemployment that is caused by fluctuations in the business cycle. The business cycle is covered in video 2.7, so you may or may not already be familiar with it. But to put it more simply, when the economy is in a recession, unemployment goes up. Less stuff is being made, so businesses don't need as many workers. So this kind of unemployment should be a pretty easy one to identify because it only really has one cause, which is that the economy is in a recession. The thing is, of those three, 
Cyclical is the only one that's clearly bad for the economy. In fact, frictional and structural unemployment can even be a sign of progress in a strong economy. People are more likely to quit a job they hate when the economy is doing well because they believe that they'll be able to get a new job pretty quickly. So frictional unemployment can be a good thing. Structural, again, is the messy one. On one hand, it's a sign of technological progress and probably means lower cost to consumers, so that's good. But for the person who lost his job and may not have the other skills that employers are looking for, this can obviously be very painful. So on the individual level, it can be rough, but it's often seen as a good thing for the future of the overall economy. As such, there's a measurement known as the natural rate of unemployment, which is the unemployment rate an economy has when there is no cyclical unemployment. In other words, it is unaffected by recessions or changes in the business cycle. Another way to say that is that it's the unemployment rate when an economy is fully utilizing its resources, and that's known as full employment output. Whether we call it the natural rate of unemployment or full employment, it's equal to frictional plus structural unemployment. So the natural rate of unemployment doesn't change due to changes in the business cycle, but it can gradually change over time due to various underlying societal, political, and economic conditions. For example, as a population ages, we may see a decrease in the natural rate of unemployment compared to a younger population, since older people are less likely to leave jobs without a new job already lined up. Additionally, countries that have policies such as high minimum wages and a more generous social safety net or stronger labor unions often have higher natural rates of unemployment since it's both more expensive to hire and lay off workers and people at the margins may have less incentive to work. All right, well, that's everything you need to know about unemployment. So until next time, this has been a La Money production. Thanks again for watching. Please hit that like button and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And make sure to check out the description for links to answers to these practice questions, as well as the great study aids I've made for you. And I will see you in the next video.